By the way, the kind of pointer works again. No, I didn't. I don't know. Nominal three years. Maybe I'll talk to you later. I'll talk to you later. Okay, so um, I'd like to talk about the potential and the actual uses of the Galactic Center as a place to learn about how Emory Dynamics work. Now, the implicit assumption here is that most LISA targets will look roughly like the Galactic Center in the sense that they will have low mass black holes, which we think are associated with relaxed high density cusps. Now, the Galactic Center itself is not going to be a prominent uh, gravitational wave source in itself, uh, excepting perhaps the very low mass stars that Mark Freitag has studied, but nevertheless, we can. Um, understand many fundamental processes having to do with the dynamics of, of uh, stars around a massive black hole. And <coughs> we've seen already this image of the galactic center here in false colors in the infrared, but the colors faithfully represent the types of stars that you see here. The red stars are old giants, and there are also the surprisingly large amount of young blue stars whose uh, provenance is still not known and the mysteries or perhaps the solution to the mystery may well have very great relevance for understanding Emory dynamics. It's not just a matter for people interested in star formation uh, in under exotic circumstances. Now uh, the outline of my talk, I hope I will be able to go through all these points, will be first to talk about relevance for understanding and calibrating the process of resonant relaxation. Next, talk about the old population of the, in the galactic center, how we find them and what they can or perhaps cannot teach us about mass segregation. And finally, then very briefly, I'll talk about a new idea having to do with uh, the how to set up conditions leading to binary disruptions. And this, of course, uh, ties in together many different uh, things that we want to observe and are already observing in the galactic center. So low eccentricity emeries, uh, the S stars, those mysterious, mysterious cluster of stars right on top of the black hole. Uh, a new class of objects which has been causing a lot of excitement in the past two years, the high velocity stars in our galaxy. And then perhaps a comment about the relevance of this dynamical process to uh, equal mass uh, uh, mergers uh, to the problem of the binary mass black hole merger. So. Starting with resonant relaxation, it's been mentioned already, I'll just try and very briefly restate what it is. So in certain cases where the potential has symmetries, high degree of symmetry, it, these symmetries um, prevent the orbits from, from uh, ev uh, evolving in a, an arbitrary way. And in a Keplerian potential, for example, the orbits are frozen into fixed ellipses. Now, when this happens, a test particle no longer feels a random kicks from all directions, but there is, it's a coherent uh, set of kicks which can be thought of as uh, some kind of a torque operating on this uh, star changing its angular momentum. Now, of course, this situation is highly idealized. Uh, real a real uh, black hole does not, is not a, the system itself is not a two-body system or um <coughs> the mass of the stars in themselves uh, starts becoming appreciably large as you go further away from the black hole and so the orbits start to precess. If you go too close to the black hole, general relativistic precession makes the orbits precess. But in the interim region, for very long times, the, the orbits are almost frozen in. And over that time, the, if you want to think about it as a mean free path, the mean free path of the star, the test star in J space is very long. So even if you then wait for large, or long times when the orbits do lose their coherence, it's still a random walk, but with a very 
large uh, mean free path, therefore a very fast random walk. And in the case of uh, the potential of a point mass, the, these torques can change both the, the direction and the magnitude of the angular momentum of the test star, thereby, for example, taking a circular orbit and making it a very radial one, which interacts strongly with the uh, black hole. Now, a, mo a more general case is where the potential is just spherical, not necessarily Keplerian. In that case, the orbits do rosettes. And the average over time, these rosettes can be thought of as uh, describing a circular analyte. And the, for reasons of symmetry, in that case, you can change the direction of the angular momentum, but not its size. So if the, angular mom if the orbit was circular, it will stay circular. It will not approach the black hole, but any coherence that was there will be destroyed. And because the first process uh, can change the magnitude, whereas the other not, we call the first one scalar resonance relaxation. And that was the uh, type of resonance relaxation that Clovis was referring to mostly. But there is also this vector resonance relaxation, which is very relevant in the galactic center, as I'll show you in a second. Now, why is this important? So the idea with the relevant relaxation is that the, pr the underlying physics are, are very robust. And in fact, it can be demonstrated in very simple simulations. What we don't know are the exact efficiency of the different parameters that go into this process. And so <clears throat> what we, I plot here, taking for our, from a our, uh, couple of our papers, is the rate of in spiral events and plunges in a, in a system where you take into account both the regular relaxation, normal relaxation, or non resonant relaxation, and the resonant relaxation, normalize but what you would get if you neglected resonant relaxation. And this is as function of this resonant relaxation efficiency, which here is described in units where the values suggested by the very small-scale simulations of Rarkin remain a decade ago uh, is one. And if it's more, it's more efficient, then you're somewhere here. If it's much less efficient, you're essentially in a case where there is no resonant relaxation. And of course, this ratio then is one. And as you see, there is a very strange coincidence here. I believe it's only a coincidence. I can't see any other explanation. That if you just choose the value suggested by Rarkin remain, you find that you're very close to the maximal enhancement of the in spiral rate. However, we're not certain about these values. And if we, the, for example, the correct value is 10 times larger, then there is this very strong cutoff. And essentially, you lose all your in spirals uh, and you gain plunge events, which are not interesting for us for the purpose of LISA. They will increase, for example, the rate of tidal disruption events, but that's a very small consolation prize. So, what can we do to check what these constants should be. So one obvious option is to do large scale simulations. But maybe that because I don't do large scale simulations myself, I tend to be a bit skeptic about the connection between sim these simulations and the real world. The systems that we simulate are much more complicated and have more surprises than we can put into our codes. Uh, so in w we it's very important to try and have some kind of an experimental check on, on this process. And the one system that is currently available is the galactic center. So what I want to show now is the potential of different dynamical components of the galactic center, center to constrain these values of, of the, the, the strength of relative relaxation. So I do it gradually by introducing into this plane, where here I have a, ti a time scale, which will describe the age of different systems in the galactic center as a function of uh, radius and specifically the semi major typical semi major axis where these tip different types of stars uh, move about and the idea is that here is the, the normal relaxation there are different ways of evaluating it but it's it's a long time scale shorter than the hubble time but not much much shorter than the hubble time on top of this we can draw curves that tell us what is the uh, time scale for um, scalar resonant relaxation. As you can see, when you go far away, you're, you start to get uh, the, the, the effect is quenched by the precession due to the enclosed mass. If you're too close, 
the effect is quenched by the presence of GR peri upshift. And there is some minimum somewhere here. And because we don't really know what is the typical mean mass in the galactic center, uh, I, I'm giving here two uh, cases for one solar mass stars and 10 solar mass stars. And the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle. And I should say at this point that we do not include yet in this calculation a mass spectrum and therefore no mass aggregation. So this is not the, probably not the, the, final, um, the final result yet. Now, the vector resonant relaxation is much, much more efficient. And as you can see, the time scales can be of the order of less than a mega year if you're close enough. Now, we think that our gravitational wave sources lie somewhere here, okay, within the critical re radius that Clovis described. I won't repeat it right now, and uh, which is of the order of a hundredth of a parsec. And see, these are old objects which have taken quite some time to, to sink into the center by dynamical friction. They, uh, they're up here. Uh, at the l at the high uh, <coughs> or large times, and it, it appears by these calculations that th they are actually completely dominated by these uh, resonant relaxation processes because they are older than the typical time for relaxation. So one in I one uh, initial conclusion is that uh, contrary to what we thought, it is quite possible that the dynamics of these Emory events are dominated by this exotic resonant relaxation process and not by normal two-body relaxation, which means that the game is open. Okay, We don't really understand well enough this process. Now, we do know that there are other populations of observable stars in the galaxy. And one of the most intriguing ones are these disk stars. So this is a system of, of uh, some 50 to 100 stars that orbit on disks of stars, almost circular orbits. And, what, and these are very young, very massive stars. And we know their, that the upper limit on their age is no more than a few million years, simply because the lifespan of such massive stars is very short. That's why this uh, very narrow uh, strip here. And what's interesting is that these rings have a very sharply defined inner cutoff. And it, happens to fall right here. There was no fit involved here. Okay? Now, I think this agreement, this, what this line means that if you had a star inside here, and some people think, I, do, I disagree with that, but some people think that the S stars, which we see in the very center, which are not on circular orbits and are not aligned along disk, but ra rather randomly oriented in space, could have been the low mass uh, members of these star disks. Now, it's obvious that this, if this is the case, then these stars could not today be on disks because the re vector resonant relaxation would have mixed up all the orientations. So the fact that this uh, purple line slices the, this uh, population just at the observed edge of the star disks, which I think is actually too good to be true given the approximations that we put into the, into the calculations, could well tell us that we, the Rao can remain values for the prefactors that determine the efficiency are, uh, are actually very close to the truth. Okay, so I'm, I'm careful to make that statement right now because I know that various uh, approximations that go into these calculations, they're definitely not the latest word on it, but this definitely shows you the potential of matching woo, the, <laughs> the um, Matching, matching the uh, stars we see with the uh, resonant relaxation. So if the stars are a different population, S stars are a different population, w it's possible perhaps to explain the fact that their uh, eccentricities are random by the fact that at least those that are close enough are being uh, um, affected by, by uh, resonant relaxation by the scalar type. And again, it's also a, w a way to explain why the relaxed giants, all the late type giants, they're old but not that old, are also seen to be completely uh, uh, without any uh, uh, particular orientation in their orbit. OK, so much for relaxation. Now, uh, quickly, through mass segregation. So Clovis said it already. I won't repeat a lot. Just rem remind you that in order to spiral in, you have to, y your star must be closer to the black hole than some critical radius. And the, these uh, 
curves derived on Monte Carlo are so close to step function that you can really think about it just as a, a single number. And the, the rate is essentially just a question of how many of your objects you pack into this critical radius, which comes out at about, ten, about a hundredth of a parsec. And here a calculation of um, mass aggregation shows you that indeed on the scale of about a hundredth of a parsec, the black holes start to dominate the population. And the question, so this could be a very important factor in determining the overall rate. And the question is, again, do we actually have some evidence for mass aggregation in the galactic center? Can we calibrate these uh, rather um, abstract calculations? So it turns out that it's very difficult to pin down mass aggregation in the galactic center. Basically, there are direct methods where you look for the objects that sink in. You cannot see directly unless under uh, very special circumstances, the massive compact objects. You cannot see massive stars which segregate because they're short-lived and actually shorter than the mass segregation time. And there are um, in many suggestions. I don't have time to go over the list. Just mention that there is some suggestion that the overabundance of X-ray sources in the central parsec could be the result of mass segregation. However, this is a large on a large scale and low statistics, remember we're interested in the scale of the hundredth of a parsec. The complementary approach, which is also problematic, and I'll d discuss the problem, is to look for the light objects that were driven out. Now, here again, there were several uh, suggestions, and I want just to mention um, one of them, which is uh, we think we are seeing some very strange effect here which may be telling us something about mass segregation, and that's using as, as a light test particle what's known as the horizontal branch red clump giants, which br brief, very briefly, these are, are stars between about half a solar mass and two solar masses, which spend the, their lifetime at low luminosities under the detection threshold, burning their helium, but once they reach and, and spanning different uh, temperatures and, and uh, luminosities, but once they reach the stage of helium burning, sorry, here burning their hydrogen, they all congregate in one point on this temperature mag uh, luminosity plot, and therefore are a very prominent feature, even if the only information you have is just the luminosity of the stars. And spectroscopy is still very difficult in the galactic center. We don't have full spectroscopic information on all the stars. So w what we have to work with is basically the luminosity. And if you do some modeling of, of what you, the, the um, population of stars that you think you should see in the galaxy, f so here is just the number counts. It's a log-log plot. Uh, on this axis is the, the infrared the magnitude, the logarithmic unit, and here the log n. And you can see this is not a very impressive feature. It's because the, I, cho I had to use a very squished scale here. This point is where all these horizontal branch giants congregate, and therefore there is an excess. And if you look at the fraction of the stars, all stars in this region, you see that at this point there is a window, a magic window between about 15 to 16 magnitude, where when you look at the population at that window, what you're seeing are old stars and low mass stars. At every other place, what you're seeing a huge mixture of red and blue, uh, old and, and, and young massive stars. But at this magic window, the mean ma mass, for example, falls almost to the, me the mean mass of the old stars. It's not quite because there is a contamination by young massive stars, and the old uh, star fraction rises to about 80%. And when you actually, this is a very recent work, not, to, not yet published by Rainer Schull and our uh, collaboration of, uh, on the GC. Um, if you look at stars somewhat fainter and somewhat uh, brighter than that magic point, magic window, what you see is that their uh, spatial distribution, this is the projected number density, falls at a s s statistically significant steeper slope than if you look at, an, at the stars only between magnitudes 15 and 16. In fact, this flat slope is what you would naively expect from mass segregation. In, it is actually much flatter than you would expect. And here is the conundrum. Uh, Mark Freitag has shown with his simulations that although it's true that mass segregation drives 
ma uh, low mass stars away from the center, it drives them while keeping the shape of the profile self-similar, so to speak. So over time, the density decreases. If we knew the density at t equals zero, we could compare, but of course we don't. If we just have the shape to work with, we may be in trouble. On the other hand, we have this result. So what is this result telling us? It's not clear right now. These stars are different from the other stars by being old and by being low mass. One or both of these properties apparently are involved in the fact that they have a quite different spatial distribution. And whether or not this is some super efficient mass segregation or just some, something to do with, with the overall relaxation and uh, initial conditions is still unclear, but at least we now have a window through which we can look through this and mess of old and young stars and look only at the old relaxed population and hopefully be able to learn uh, something more in more detail about the way that these systems behave. And I'll finish with this uh, rather uh, busy slide having to do with binary disruptions. So we've heard uh, uh, already about the possibility that the binary comes, approaches the black hole, undergoes uh, a slingshot effect or a binary uh, b tidal uh, disruption. One of the members is, is caught on a tightly and fairly circular orbit and the other is ejected forcibly away. And um, Cole in his paper calculated the ratio between this process and the process of just throwing stars, individual stars, randomly uh, on very uh, radial orbits and found that it's quite likely that this process dominates, but the question remains what is the overall, the absolute value of the rate, okay? And <coughs> a recent work we did with uh, my PhD student Hagai Peretz and with Clovis had to do with the question not exactly of these types of binaries which already one object is a compact object, but generally speaking what exactly is the thing that sets the relaxation rate at the galactic center? And we consider the possibility that it's not individual stars perturbing other stars that is the dominant effect, but rather the fairly few but very massive components that you find typically in the centers of uh, gas-rich galaxies like our own, um, late-type galaxies, which are mainly giant molecular clouds. And it's... I don't have the time to show it, I'll be happy to answer questions later. It's easy to show that even a small um, number of fraction, a number density of very massive objects could easily dominate the relaxation. And these are curves, okay, so what we see here is this is the semi-major axis, this is the number of these S stars, this is a cumulative plot, so we know that at the inner 0.04 parsecs there are be between uh, something like 30 or so such S stars. And here we consider what would be the effect of various massive perturbers in throwing binaries to the center, having one of them captured and the other sent off away as a hypervelocity star. And these, are, uh, these uh, curves are based on observations of actual observations of, of giant molecular clouds in our galactic center. There is some uh, uncertainty about their mass, hence there are two models here. And what you can see is that the observed number sits comfortably within the region of the observations, okay? On top of that, the number that can be inferred from direct observations of high-velocity stars is that there should be roughly between, say, 10 and 70 high-velocity stars in the galaxy uh, of, of, t of properties similar to those of the S stars. This model predicts between 50 to 350, Thereby, which means that essentially it's, it's consistent with what we observe. And therefore we are very enthusiastic that it could well be that massive perturbers are the factor dominating the tidal disruption rate of binaries. And if that's the case, there could be very interesting Im uh, implications, which we haven't yet explored in detail, to the rate at which you throw in binaries that either have already a compact member and therefore form uh, low eccentricity uh, emeries, or you just uh, throw in the center many massive, uh, I'm in my last sentence, many massive uh, uh, stars that will eventually become compact objects 
in situ, very close to the black hole, and therefore supply the black hole. And I'll just mention as a, as a bit of uh, promotion that one of the, this, the fact that the relaxation is dominated by massive perturbers and not by stars have far-reaching implications well beyond just gravitational wave physics. And one of, uh, one of them is that the entire nucleus is, uh, is much more relaxed than we would uh, think. And in, f in fact, this would actually lead to very rapid binary uh, massive black hole mergers, regardless of assumptions about uh, triaxiality or, or perturbations to the galaxies or whatever. I mean, w whenever you have enough gas to form giant molecular clouds, and most galaxies, even ellipticals, have such gas, you will probably drive uh, the merger very fast together to the final point of merger. Um, so I'll just end with, I'll flash my uh, last summary points and I'll end here. Thank you. These things act not near the black hole, but on the scale of parsecs and tens of parsecs. Now, <coughs> the thing is that for binaries, and here our numbers are slightly different from the numbers you have in your paper, but that's open for discussion. Binar the, the, the loss cone for binaries is very wide, because of course the binary can uh, be disrupted even if it's not that close to the black hole compared to, say, tidal disruption of a single star. And stars in themselves are not efficient enough to fill it up. And therefore, even if you have contribution from these big objects far away, which do not actually have to approach the star, they just you know, float there, they will help bridge the gap. They will, fill um, they will fill regions of the lost cone which would not be filled with stars alone. And that's where the enhancement comes from, okay, from the larger scale. So there have been surveys, and they uh, surveyed the central tens of parsecs, and they actually have a, a cat, uh, catalogs with lists of, of molecular clouds, projected positions, and various ways of estimating the mass, assuming they're virial, not assuming they're virial, in the, from molecular line ratios and intensities and so on. And this gives a spread of, there is quite some uncertainty about the masses, but even if you take the the lower limits, you still get interesting results here. So, so what you really need is the product of the number density times the mass square to be high. Okay, so you could either use many low mass clouds or a fewer high mass clouds. Now, we are assuming something of the order of 100 clouds in the inner, uh, what was it, uh, 50 parsecs or so, and with masses between 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 5 or so. But we're essentially, essentially we, just to check that we're not getting carried away, what we did was simply take those catalogs and plug in the numbers. It's essentially, just calculate the actual uh, relaxation time that you get if you plug in the numbers that you see, instead of just, you know, making some toy model, a power law, mass function, or something like that. We get very good numbers. I, we, I'm, we cannot really, at this level of analysis, you know, pin down the exact value to within a factor of two. But we, we can definitely make the, a strong case to the fact that the relaxation is dominated by, by these objects and not by stars. Okay. Right, well, that depends on the gas content, or if you want cluster content, it really doesn't matter, but let's stick to gas. So there are observations that ellipticals also have uh, uh, substantial amounts of molecular gas in the center, although generally they're gas-poor galaxies. And if conditions there are in any way similar to what we see, we actually observe directly in the galactic center, then yes, the relaxation should be dominated by these uh, clumps, by these uh, clouds. 